The Lord is good. What an awesome time we had this morning thus far. God is good. The whole weekend was great. Even this morning, some of our young people are down in Tacoma, worshiping God with the brothers down there, uh, together with Christy and Cornell and the other Christy. Yeah, we have so many Christies in our church. Good Christies. God bless them all. Hallelujah. We've been down uh, Friday, Saturday evenings at the conference, youth conference at Alim Church in Tacoma, and it was great. We heard good messages. Amen, young people? Powerful messages. The worship was good, and God is good in every season. Amen? He is good, and we are happy to be here this morning in the presence of God with the brothers and sisters that we love. We love you guys, and we believe and we hope that you love us too. Amen? God bless you all. God bless you all. This morning I will be uh, speaking on uh, a subject that I believe it's very important. I believe that we have to get a handle of this message if you want to get anywhere in life. If you want to accomplish anything in life, you got to stay and be focused. Amen? Be focused not for one day, not for one week, not even for one year, but for your whole life. Is that easy? You can if you do the right things, right? Uh, I'd like to read from uh, the book of Nehemiah, chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. And pay attention because this is a test. I am going to ask you something at the end of my reading, and you're going to have to answer. V verse 1 Now, when Sam Ballot and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of the enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there were no bridges left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates. Sembalat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let, me, let us meet together at Hakafir in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent the messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Say it with me this morning. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sam Ballad, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. It is, in it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is, that is why you are building the wall. And according to this report, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him, saying, no such thing as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Now, when I went into the house of Shemea, the son of Dehea, son of Metabal, who was confined to his house. He said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and leave? I will not go in. And... I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had, but he had prophesied the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. 
For this purpose he was hired that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin. And so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, oh my God, according to those things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Question. You are all waiting for the question, right? How many of you were able to stay focused while the reading of the text? Anybody has the courage to say, I did? Yes, amen. How many of you can stay focused until the end of the sermon? Anybody can promise to stay focused? Amen, amen. Well, we live in a society that is characterized by inability to focus. Inability to focus. You know, there is a pandemic out there, but it's not a virus. It's a pandemic that it's called ADD. Inability to focus, right? Attention deficit disorder. You hear about this disease often, right? But we apply it to kids. We say, well, this is for children. Children at school struggle with attention deficit disorder. The truth is that it's not only the children, right? The doctors, the medics, they say that the child can focus for two to three minutes times his age. If he's five years old, he can stay focused for 15 minutes, yeah? Does it? Is it true? Can your kids stay focused for 15 minutes while you talk? Hopefully they can, right? Well, it seems like uh, not only kids have this problem, but adults as well. People go from one decision to another in a matter of minutes. They change their mind from day to day. They change their position on things from day to day. They cannot stay focused on one thing for long. Even when it comes to the decision to follow Jesus Christ, you see people going back and forth. You see people struggling with their decision, making up their mind, am I going to serve the Lord or am I going to serve myself? Am I going to get baptized? Well, I'm not ready. I need to, well, make up your mind and stay focused. Amen? People lose focus very quickly. That's very true, right? We are like a yo-yo, right? Up and down, up and down. So quickly we cannot stay focused. One of the most uh, common answers when you ask somebody, how are you doing? One of the most common honest answers, right? Because you would say that the most common answer is what? Uh, I'm doing well, you know, fine. Thank you for asking. Well, I don't think this is the honest answer. What would be one of the honest answers that you receive when you ask somebody, how are you doing? I am bored. Is it true, young people? Are you bored? Truly? Most of the times? All the times? Even when you're doing the things that you love to do or like to do? The other day I was, uh, I was uh, working on my computer and next to me I had my son and he had uh, his time to, to play a video game. And uh, no, I'm not supporting video games, uh, but you know, we have to give a little bit, right? We have to negotiate. And uh, to my surprise, he stops and he says, Dad, can you call so-and-so? I want to play with them. And I said, uh, yeah, sure. I was excited actually to hear that. But then he said, you know, I am so bored. And I praise God. I mean, playing video games and being bored is awesome. An answer to my prayer. But the truth is that we get bored even with the things that we like to do, right? Too much of the good things become bad things. If you can find the secret, the secret to stay focused, you can almost guarantee to succeed in everything you do. If you can find a secret, if you can stay focused on what you're doing, it doesn't matter what it is. You can almost guarantee yourself to be successful in what you're doing. 
In the text that we read this morning, we learned of a man called Nehemiah. Nehemiah was assigned a task, a task, something to do, a mission to accomplish. Nehemiah was asked, was, had the desire, the one, the desire to, to build, to rebuild the Jerusalem. The task was difficult. It wasn't easy. The resources are limited. Material resources, human resources, they were limited. The opposition was intense. People were against him. Nehemiah, before all this, he had a comfortable life. He had a good job. He was the cupbearer of the king. He had a comfortable house. He had appreciation. He was respected and trusted by the king. Imagine, the king had to trust the man that would serve him. The king had to trust the man that would give him the cup to drink from. Because one of the ways to get rid of the kings back then was to poison them, right? And the cup bearer was supposed to test and to check the drinks that the king was supposed to drink. So he was trusted. He had a good relationship with the king. He had a good life. But he had to give it all up to fulfill a purpose that God called him to do. His job was replaced, you know, his good job. His awesome job was replaced with a dirty and dangerous job. He had to come to this place, to this deserted place, where people were against him, where the wild animals were there against him, where there was you no know, heat and dust and dangers everywhere he turned. His comfortable house was replaced with a shack. He didn't have a comfortable place to live. He had to come from the palace and sleep with the guys, you know, you know how a room looks after a bunch of guys sleep in a room that's air conditioned and it's nice and clean. Imagine a shack someplace in the fields with a bunch of guys with no showers, right? Not comfortable. He gave it up. The appreciation of the king that trusted him was, rep was replaced with disrespect and threats of men. This man had to give up on a lot of things in order to accomplish this purpose for his life. What were the strategies that the enemy used to discourage Nehemiah? You know, now we see if we pay attention to the text. What was the first strategy that he used, the enemy used? The first strategy was what I call the sweet talk. Hey, Nehemiah, come over here. You know, we are your friends. We are your buddies. We, we like you. We want well for you. We want you to succeed. We want you to do well. Why don't you come and counsel with us, right? We read of this in verse 2. Sam Balat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together in this place. But they intended to harm me. He says, well, the intention was evil, but they presented it well. They sweet-talked it. They said, come, because we want to help you. Does it happen in your life as well? Are people in your life, are your enemies that they are trying, pretending to try to help you, but actually they are setting you up for failure? How is this strategy used against you? And what is the lesson? Most importantly, what is the lesson that you should learn from this? Be careful when somebody is sweet-talking you. Be careful. If somebody is extra nice to you, question mark. Be careful. If the enemy is nice to you. Oh, Satan is so good at this. The Bible tells us that he even becomes an angel of light trying to deceive us. He doesn't come with his ugly face. He doesn't come with his, you know, nasty side. He wants to show you the good side. But behind, oh, the strategy, the evil plan is set up for you. So be careful. Be careful. Well, if that doesn't work, the enemy will try to threaten you. Threaten you. What you're doing, they, saw, they told Nehemiah, this will get you into trouble. You are trying to do something against the king. You are trying to rebel. You and your people are trying to rebel. 
Well, if Nehemiah didn't listen to the sweet talk, he was wise enough to not believe them when they came with this threat against him. And he moves on and he tells them, what you are saying, what you are saying is made up in your mind. You guys are lying to me. You guys are trying to distract me. You are trying to stop me. You are not my friends. You are my enemy. And now you prove it because you are trying to threaten me. So lesson number two. Be ready to pay the price of suffering unjustly. Unjustly. Because many times you will have to suffer unjustly because the enemy is lying about you. The enemy is trying to set you up. And I believe that as Christians, in a day as today, there will be instances, there will be times when we will have to suffer unjustly. People will be willing to lie against you, to set you up, to say lies about you just so to get you in trouble. It happens, doesn't it? It happens in schools. It happens at work. It happens in many places. Be ready to pay the price. The third strategy, the third strategy, this is very dangerous. This strategy that the enemy is using, when he exhausts everything else, he comes to this strategy. And this strategy is very dangerous because he's trying to deceive you using your friends, using the people you trust, using the pastors in the church, using the prophets, using the leaders, using those people who you look up to. Let's read from verse 10. Now, when I went into the house of Shemeah, the son of Dehleah, the son of Methabel, who was confined to his house, he said, let us meet together in the house of the Lord, Nobody was allowed to enter the temple and not being killed by God. But this prophet comes to Nehemiah and he says, well, let's come into the house of the Lord. Let's enter the temple because they are about to come and kill you. They want to kill you by night. They are after you. And this is the prophet. This is a man who carries authority. This is a man who carries power. This is a man who demands obedience because he speaks in the name of the Lord. Lesson number three, be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you listen to. It could be somebody who carries a name with authority. It could be somebody who you trust. Be careful who you listen to. Don't trust just everybody. In spite of all this, Nehemiah moved on. In spite of all this opposition, Nehemiah stayed focused. He said, I have a great work to do. I am not going to come down. I am not going to stop what I'm doing because I am called to accomplish a mission. And this mission is important to me. This mission is what I'm called for. This is my calling. I am not going to allow you to distract me. I am not going to listen to you. I'm not going to be terrified by what you're doing, what you're saying. What, what, what was the purpose of the enemy? The purpose was that Nehemiah would be afraid and stop building. Focus on one thing. Focus on one thing. Focus on one thing, and that is God. In this life, we are called to focus on one thing. Remember the story of Martha and Mary. Martha and Mary, two sisters, but so different. And what a story it is to illustrate to us how we should live our lives. Luke chapter 10, verse 41 and 42. But the Lord answered to her, to Martha, and he said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen the good portion, and that will not be taken away from her. All oh, like Martha, there are many things that we are concerned with. There are many things that consume us. Our lives are cluttered with so many important things, so-called important, when only one thing is what matters the most. 
You know, society developed systems, developed uh, uh, seminars and training to, to, to teach us how to organize our lives. We have so many seminars. We have so many things that people are doing trying to teach us how to organize our lives because our lives are so busy, so cluttered, so much going on. Remember the illustration, you probably heard it before, with the professor who came to the class one morning and he brought a jar and he put it on the table and he filled the jar with rocks, with big rocks. And he asked the class, can anything else fit? Can I put something more in this jar? And the class, well, said the jar is full. Well, the professor takes some sand and puts sand in there and then asks the class again, and I'm going to move fast. Then next he comes with water and he adds water and he keeps putting more and more things in that jar. But I found one thing that's wrong with that illustration. There's one thing that's wrong with that illustration. He put more than one rock in there. He put more than one rock in there. There is only one rock. There is only one thing that matters. There is only one thing that is important. And that's God. Hallelujah. That is God. We are called to stay focused on one thing. And that thing is God. And we're supposed to stay focused on God every single day. Focused on God through the seasons. It's focused on God through every season of our life. Our lives are like the changing seasons. Yes, we have, we, have, we have spring, we have summer, we have wind, uh, fall, we have winter. It changes all the time. It changes all the time. But one thing is constant. One thing is constant in everything we do. Everything you do in spring, everything you do in summer, everything you do in fall, everything we do in winter has one purpose, is to keep you alive. To keep your life. What do you do in winter time? You are preparing, you are sharpening your tools, you are getting... I'm, I'm using the illustration of a farmer. What a farmer is doing, he's preparing for spring. If you mess up winter time, if you mess up the preparation season, you will miss up spring. Spring, you don't have time to fix your tools. Spring, you have to plow. Spring, you have to plant the seeds. If you don't plant anything in the spring, you have nothing to tend to during summertime. Summertime is the season we have to protect. You have to keep the crop protected from the enemy, from the bugs, from the weeds, from everything that's ready to take it over. Fall is time when you pick a harvest. But every activity in every season has one purpose, to keep you alive physically. All the activities in your life. If you're a child, if you're a youth, if you're an adult, if you are an older person. All the activities that you do in your life, in every season of your life, has to do with one thing only. And that's to serve and to obey God. God is the center of our lives. God is everything for us. Hallelujah. We need to stay focused on one thing during all the seasons of our lives. John chapter 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only through God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is the purpose. If you want to have a purpose in life, this is the purpose, that you may know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. You know why? Because this is eternal life. Hallelujah. This is what eternal life is. We have, we have two, two ideas when it comes to the timeline. You know, we all have a timeline. We are born, we live our lives, and then we die. And this is a timeline of the world. The world has this timeline. Those who do not have God, they have this timeline. I am, gonna, I am born, I have nothing to say when I'm born. Somebody else makes that decision. I'm going to live my life, and then I'm, I'm going to die. Okay, this timeline is the timeline that will take you in places where you're going to live for yourself, you're going to be selfish, you're going to be egoist, you're going to be egocentric, you're going to live a life unworthy of the calling of God. Because in your mind, everything ends at the grave. What happens with people that live a life like that? Childhood 
there's not much to say about, right? Everything you do as a child is acceptable. You are a baby, babies receive a lot of grace. Great babies don't have much to worry about. It's the time, it's the age of innocence. Everything they focus on is nothing. Everything they focus on, it's not important, right? It's irrelevant. But they come to the age of accountability. The age when they understand good and evil. The age when they can choose between bad and good. And this is the school years, right? The school years. For, for kids in this time and age, it's the school years. What are people focusing on in their school years? What's one of the most thing that kids focus on in school? Sports, right? Those are the good kids I'm talking about. I'm not talking about those who do evil, bad things. The good things, right? Because sometimes the good things are, uh, are, uh, are getting us in trouble, right? Sports. You spend four, five, six years of your life being consumed by sports. I am not against sports. I, like, I love to play volleyball with you guys. I love to, to, to play ping pong and other things. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being consumed and focused on something that's so temporary. You know what you're going to have left after, after those six or four or five years or whatever? You're going to practice sports? What are you going to have left? Bunch of injuries. Yes. Scars. Broken body. I was uh, told of one thing that people... Uh, coaches when when they choose football players they said that sometimes you know people are surprised why they choose a specific a certain person over somebody else because apparently when you see them play this person is much better than the other person so how come a coach would choose this person over the other person who shows better skills than this other person and the answer is they look at their health rec report they look at their x-ray they look at their body and they say that an athlete that's putting himself through a lot of stress physically, their bones, their skeleton ages really fast. And when a coach looks at this guy who is really good and he has to pick between him and this guy who's not so good but he's, he has healthier body, he has better bones, he will go with this person because they know that this person is gone, this person is done. As a young person, if you spend five, four, seven years of your life focusing on sports, not only that you lose and you miss out on what God has planned for you, but you're going to end up regretting and suffering for the rest of your life from the injuries that you acquired. And I'm not even talking about injuries that you can acquire spiritually because being in the wrong environment, being with the wrong crowd, being attracted in other problems. I'm talking about physically only. You know, I had an incident. When I was 20 years old, I went skiing and I injured my ankle, my knee, my left knee. And uh, didn't go to the doctor for a while. I thought I was tough and strong and I'm going to heal myself. And I ended up suffering for years from that knee injury just because one moment of, uh, you know, navigating. What's that word in English? Look it up. What is another thing that people are focusing on this young age? Relationships. Relationships. Girls and boys, but especially girls, because you are so much more frail, so much more sensitive, so much more fragile. Don't focus on relationships. Oh, I like that boy. I can't sleep. I am so focused. I am so concentrated. I want to be everywhere he is. I want to hear every word he says. And you boys, in the same way, consumed with relationships that takes you nowhere. You'll end up with broken hearts. You'll end up 
with sleepless nights because you focus on the wrong thing at the wrong time. Self-esteem, body image, should we go into it? Nine more minutes. Self-esteem, body image, wow. How much we invest in this temporary thing? And why do we do this? Because our timeline ends at the grave. You know, I was debating if I should show you guys a picture of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger or Schweitzerniger, whatever you call him. I wanted to show you a picture when he was, you know, the way he was and a current picture, how he looks today. All that years of work, all that sweat, all that effort to end up with a body like he has today, what a waste, what a waste. You guys can look it up. Not now. But just look at that picture. Body image. Body building. Working so hard for something that's not worth it. Why? Because this tent, this tent, this body is given to us as a tool. And we are supposed to use it for the purposes that was created to be used. Not for what we want, not for what we desire, not to enhance it in any way. Just to take care of it. Just to maintain it. Maintain it. Yes, eat right. Yes, exercise right. Yes, sleep right. Amen, young people, sleep right. You have no idea how important that it is. And someday when you'll be old, you'll remember what I'm telling you today. You'll miss those nights when you can sleep good you will miss those nights sleep well take care of your body but that's it to have it as an instrument as a tool to accomplish the purposes that God gave you to accomplish not to impress anybody not to show off not to for any other reason but for this alone this body is temporary if you like it great if you don't like it even better one day you'll get rid of it Amen? Well, let me move on. Next season. I'm done with you guys. Don't leave yet. Adulthood. Adulthood. People like me, people like those over here with less hair on their heads. What are we focusing on? What are we focusing on? Oh, we have more important things to focus on, right? We focus on our career. We focus on our families. We focus to make money, as many as we can, right? We focus to, to, to receive recognition, to receive uh, you no know, applause, to be appreciated. We, we, we focus on those things. And those things are so empty. Those things are so worthless because all this ends at the next phase. How long is our adulthood? How many years do we get to, to focus on those things, on, on, on houses, on cars, on fame, on recognition, on, on, on careers? 40 years for those who are workaholics? Yes? How much time do you have? When you compare this with eternity, put a price on it. Is it worth it to focus on it? I'm not saying not to be responsible. I'm not saying not to work to provide for your family. But do not make that the purpose of your life. Do not make your career your purpose. Do not make getting a nice house your purpose. Do not make getting a nice car your purpose. Don't live for those things. Those things are not worth it, are not worth it. They are temporary, they are passing away, and the world with the things of the world are passing away. But those who trust God, those who live in obedience with God, those who are his children, they are not passing away, they are living on in eternity, hallelujah. You also prepare for retirement. How many people prepare for retirement so diligently? They prepare, they have everything planned only to find out that they uh, die of cancer or something else before they even reach that age. 
I'm not saying not to be responsible, but I'm saying don't make that your focus. Don't live for that purpose alone because the time will come and you might not even use what you're preparing. Don't live for that. Old age, retirement, long-term care, I'm not going to get into it. Nobody is here needing long-term care, right? <laughs> All right. Nothing is left unless we understand that death is only the beginning. Death is only the beginning. If you have the perspective of eternity, if you understand that this life is temporary, it changes everything in your life from childhood, from school years, from adulthood, from being an older person, it changes your thinking, it changes your mind, it changes who you are. You focus on other things. In college, young people, you know this, when you go to college, they ask you, what do you major in? What do you major in? You major in science? You, you wanna become an engineer like somebody over there? Did they ask you to take biology? No, no, why? That's not a major for, for, for engineering, right? How, who wants to be a doctor? Who wants to be a nurse? Do you have to take biology? Do you have to take some chemistry? You have to focus on those. You have to major in this, right? What's the lesson? Don't spend major time on minor things. Don't spend major time on minor things. Do you have to take care of yourself? Do you have to take care of your family? Do you have to do those things that you have to do? Do it, but don't spend major time in minor things. Don't waste your time on minor things. Every season is focused on a different activity, but for the same purpose, for the same purpose. How can we stay focused on the one thing through all the seasons of life. How can you stay focused? You might say, yes, if you say all those things, but you know, how do you do it? How do you do it? How do I do this? How can I do this? How can I go to school and be focused on God? How can I go to work and be focused on God? How can I do life and be focused on God all the time and every time? The Bible gives us the solution. The Bible gives us the answer. Everything you do, do it unto the Lord. When you do everything unto the Lord, you stay focused on God. When you go to school and you do it just like you'll do it for the Lord, you'll stay focused on God. When your job, when, you're, when you are going to work and you go like you would go and work for Jesus Christ, you will be focused on God. When you get lost into the details of life, you have to do one thing. You have to refocus. Refocus. If you go to school, if you go to school and, and, and you know, you just get distracted. You just get busy. You just get occupied. You, you get so busy with the exams. You get so busy with the things that you have to do for the school. And you lose focus. All you have to do is say, Lord, I come back. I'm doing this for your glory. I'm doing this because I want to become a good engineer to serve, to honor you. I'm doing this because I want to become a nurse or a doctor to serve and honor you. I'm doing this because I want to become somebody who honors you with the energy, with the resources, with the abilities, with our lives. Everything that you do, do it as unto the Lord. Make him the center. Make him the purpose. Refocus when you get busy. Refocus when you get distracted. When you get distracted, you have to refocus quickly, just like when you drive a car. You drive a car and sometimes, you know, I love to just, you know, I love scenery. I love to look through the window when I drive, right? And sometimes something catches my attention and I turn my head and I, if I don't refocus quickly, if I don't refocus quickly from what I'm doing, I might crash. When you catch yourself there, you're not focused on God. Refocus quickly. Refocus quickly before you hit the tree, before you hit the other car, before you get off the road. Refocus quickly. When you lose sight of where you are going, refocus. Once I was up in the mountains back in Romania when I was 16 years old with a group of young people and we got lost. We got lost 
and it got dark and it was it was night time it got late and we had to really focus and one thing that we had to focus was one yellow circle one yellow circle that was on the trees that was on certain rocks that we had to focus on to follow it so we can get back to the camp one thing we had to focus on to get where we wanted to go one thing you have to focus in life if you need and if you want to finish well and that is God hallelujah Paul is an example of a man who knew how to focus on God Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 13 and 14 brethren I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do one thing I do, I forget what's behind me. I don't pay attention to the distractions anymore. I don't care for those temporary things more. I am looking for the things that are ahead. Hallelujah. May God help us. I press towards the goal for the prize of the uphold calling of Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, another perfect example that we should follow that gives us an example of a man with a mission a man with a mission you are a man with a mission you are a woman with a mission you have to focus on the mission that you have john chapter 12 verse 27 28 my now my soul is troubled and i and what i shall say father save me from this hour no jesus said but for this purpose i came to this hour that this ministry that this purpose will be fulfilled that's the reason i am here you have a purpose my brother and sister you have a purpose you have something to live for for jesus was that the father would be glorified for Jesus was that we will be saved. For Jesus was that he will give us a future. For Jesus was that you will be here this morning hearing these words. Jesus came into this world with a mission that was, that's what he lived for. He lived for this mission. He was consumed for this mission. Everything that he had, he gave to this mission. What is your mission? What are our missions? If you are consumed by sports if you are consumed by relationships if you are consumed by riches by fame by recognition you will be disappointed you will be disappointed but if you live your life in a way worthy of the calling of God if you'll find if you live a, your life in a way worthy of your calling you will find purpose you will find fulfillment you will find your destiny sports will leave you with injuries. Relationships will leave you with broken hearts. Riches and fames and recognition will leave you empty. But if you follow Christ, you will find purpose. You will find fulfillment for your life. What will benefit a man, the Bible says, to gain the whole world if he loses his soul? What would benefit us to gain the whole world if we are losing our souls? I therefore a prisoner for the Lord, says Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. This morning, if you allow the enemy to distract you, if you were deceived into consuming yourselves for the things of this world, if you lost sight of where you are going, then this is the time for us, for me, and for you to refocus. Let's stand on our feet this morning. And let's come in a prayer this morning, asking God that he will give us the strength, that he will give us the power, that he will help us to refocus our lives on one thing that matters, on the only thing that matters, which is God Almighty. Glory to his name. Amen. Amen.